All right, so our first lecture is just going to be an introduction to physiology. So we're giving you an idea of what we're going to cover over the semester, okay? So each lecture has a title, and then every slide is going to have a slide number. So again, you can either print these out and take notes on them if you want, but I also recommend just taking old-fashioned notes and then writing down what slide I was talking about while you were taking notes, so then you can refer back to them if you need to. All right, so then I always have organizational slides. So in the organizational slides, it's what's going to be covered. So we're going to talk about levels of organization, okay, as part of the lecture, and then we'll talk about homeostasis. And here, this is covered in chapter one, pages two through eight. Okay, and then homeostasis is covered in chapter one, pages nine through 12, in the sixth edition of this textbook. Right, if you're using the fifth edition, it might be off by only a page or two. If you're using a different textbook, I have no idea what the page numbers are, okay? All right, so we are studying physiology in this class. A whole bunch of you have already taken anatomy. What is anatomy? the study of? The structures, exactly. Whereas physiology is the study of the function. Okay, so we're gonna add function to those structures. Obviously, I can't talk about physiology without also talking about some anatomy, but I don't go nearly into as much detail about anatomy as you do in anatomy. If you haven't taken anatomy yet, don't worry. I do enough basic anatomy so that you can understand the physiology of it. Okay, and we are gonna cover the physiology or the function of the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, circulatory system, respiratory system, gastrointestinal system, endocrine system, reproductive, immune, urinary. We really don't cover integumentary very much. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about levels of organization, okay, from the chemical all the way up to the organism, and this is human physiology, so in this case, the organism is the human. Okay, so chemical level, here we have a chemical that's found in the human body. Got any chemistry nerds in here that recognize this? Maybe you've taken biochemistry already, or cell bio. It's a phospholipid. Excellent. If you didn't know what the heck it was, don't worry. We're going to talk about them. Okay? We've got a phospholipid here. Where do you find phospholipids in the human body? Membrane. The cell membranes. Exactly. Okay? Here we've got a cell. And this is a cell that is part of the small intestine. <coughs> Actually, no, it's part of the stomach, right? So it's going to be a cell that is part of the stomach. So here we have a single cell, right? And here we have tissue within the um, stomach. Here we have an actual organ, i.e. the stomach, which is part of the GI tract, which would be the body system, which is part of this sad-looking lady, right? <laughs> Who's transparent so that we can see her GI tract. Okay, so if you haven't taken chemistry yet, or it's been a long time since you've taken chemistry, one of the great things about that mastering A and P is that it has a little section for get ready for A and P, and it has a chemistry review. Okay, I highly recommend doing that because chemistry is pretty important for physiology. Okay, so chemicals are the building blocks of our cells, which are the building blocks of our tissues, which are the building blocks of our organs, which are the building blocks of our organ systems, which make up us. Okay, and the smallest unit we'll talk about are atoms. Okay, so atoms are a collection of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So here we have four different atoms, which are the most common atoms in the human body. 96% of you is made up of carbon, hydrogen, <laughs> oxygen, and nitrogen. Okay, so carbon has six neutrons and six protons. So what's its atomic mass? 12. 
okay? Because electrons are so small, they don't add to the atomic mass. You'll notice it has six protons and six electrons to make it neutral. When you have an equal number of protons and neutrons, that atom is neutral. It's not charged, okay? The pluses weigh out the minuses, or the minuses weigh out the pluses, however you want to talk, think about it. Okay, neutrons have no charge. They're neutral. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of atoms, and then electrons orbit around. That first orbit only, or fills when there's just two electrons. Okay, and then you go out to the second orbit, and how many electrons do you need to fill that one? Eight. So is carbon filled up? Could it take more? Yes. So this is why carbon is one of the most common atoms in our body, because it wants more electrons. Okay? It's got an empty second shell. Not empty, but it doesn't have enough electrons in its second shell. It wants more. It wants to make bonds with other atoms. And its favorite atoms to make bonds with, right, are hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, right? Because they also want more electrons, okay? So carbon will bind with oxygen or hydrogen or nitrogen, and it will share electrons. And whenever they share electrons, that's called a covalent bond. And those are really strong, okay? And they're a source of energy, because when you break a covalent bond, you get a release of energy. So what our cells do all day is they make covalent bonds and they break covalent bonds. Okay, they put in energy to make them, and then they release energy when they get broken. Okay, atoms combine together to make macromolecules, or your textbook calls them biomolecules. But I learned them as macromolecules, so I often slip and just call them macromolecules. Okay, the four macromolecules that we're going to spend some time talking about are carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleotides. Okay, so carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleotides. What do we use carbohydrates for in our bodies? Sugar, sugar yeah, so sugar we use for energy, okay? We've got glucose being shown right here. Notice it's a collection of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? We like to break all those covalent bonds get a release of energy, and we use that energy that gets released from clipping apart those bonds to make ATP, right? Here we have ATP down here. So ATP is a type of nucleotide. That's the energy currency of our cells. This is what our, almost all the molecules in our cells use to do work. They use ATP. Okay, and we'll talk about ATP a little bit later next week. Okay. Proteins. So here we've got a protein. Proteins are collections of amino acids, okay? And they have a significant amount of structure, and they're only functional once they've got that quaternary structure. We'll talk about how they get folded, etc. What do we use proteins for? For what? For formation. For formation, yeah. So formation of... Tissues. Tissues, exactly. So the cytoskeleton, which is inside our cells, the extracellular matrix, which is holding our cells together, right? Collagen, keratin, you know, our hair, our nails, etc. Lots of protein in there, okay? Muscle is primarily protein. And what do we use our muscle for? Moving, yeah, okay? Smooth muscle we use for moving things within our body, okay? Skeletal muscle we use for moving our body. What else do we use proteins for? We guys heard of enzymes? Okay, vast majority of enzymes in our cells which do things, do chemical reactions, right? They're proteins. Okay, we're a lot of proteins. Proteins do things, okay? Lipids, here we've got a phospholipid being shown here. And where do we find phospholipids? What? Cell membrane. We do find lipid in fat, though, but a different kind of lipid. Okay, so cell membranes. So our cell membranes that wrap all our cells are made up of phospholipids. 
okay? We also store energy in fats, right? But that storage, that lipid storage is in triglycerides, okay? So our adipose tissue, which is our fat storage, those are made up of triglycerides. We'll talk about the different types of fats. Okay, steroid hormones are also a type of lipid, so we use them for signaling as well. Okay, we store our energy as fat and not as carbohydrate. Okay, so plants store energy, a lot of it, as carbohydrate. We store it as lipids, okay? And the reason we store it as lipids is because lipids are really energy dense and they are light. Okay, in order to store carbohydrate, you need a lot of water. So if we stored starch like potatoes, we would be too heavy to move, right? But because plants don't move, they can store a lot of carbohydrate. Right, and then nucleotides. We already talked about ATP, which is the energy currency of our cells, right? But we also have um, other purines, pyrimidines, so adenine, guanine, cytosine, uracil. What, does, what do those make up? DNA and RNA, our genetic code. Okay. All right, so moving up one more level, let's talk about cells a little bit. There are basic unit of life. Ooh, how many microbiology majors do we have in here? Hey, you spend your class time talking about organisms that are only one cell big. Okay, so bacteria are only one cell. We as humans have trillions of cells. However, we all started as a single cell. Right, so you all started as an egg that got fertilized by your father's sperm. Okay, and then underwent cell division. So this is an early stage of human blastocyst, which continues to undergo cell division and cell differentiation until you turned into an infant. Okay, and then you continue to have cell division and differentiation until so you grew to your adult form. And you still have cell division and differentiation going on. Okay, so groups of cells with similar specialization make up our tissues. We're gonna talk about four primary tissue types, okay? Muscle tissue, nervous tissue, epithelial tissue, and connective tissue. Those are four primary types. So let's talk about muscle tissue first, okay? It's probably obvious. Muscle tissue specialized to contract. And our muscle tissue is either voluntary or involuntary. Voluntary meaning we can consciously control it. Okay, involuntary means it contracts without our conscious input. Okay, so skeletal muscle is consciously controlled. Right, so skeletal muscle is voluntary muscle. Smooth muscle and cardiac muscle is involuntary muscle. All right, we'll spend a lot of time talking about skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. We're not going to talk in too much detail about smooth muscle, right? But it's involuntary, right? Lines a lot of our organs and helps propel things within our body. All right, flexing of our forearm. What type of muscle will do that for us? Skeletal muscle. And is it under our conscious control? Yep. Okay. Pumping of blood. What type of muscle will do that? Cardiac muscle. Is it under our conscious control? No. Mm -mm. Okay. Mixing of food in our stomach. Our stomach has what type of muscle? Smooth muscle. And is that under our conscious control? No. About one third of the way down our esophagus, we switch from skeletal muscle, and then the rest of the way is all smooth muscle. Okay, nervous tissue is specialized to transmit signals and plays a major role in communication. Rapid communication. 
Okay, our nervous system is all about rapid communication. So, nervous tissue, we've got a lot of neurons, right? They're part of the nervous tissue that we're gonna talk about. They have branches to receive signals and then branches to transmit signals. Okay, the branches on these two neurons here that receive signals are called dendrites, right? Okay, and then the branch that sends signal is called the axon, okay? And we've got the axon terminals. Some neurons also process some information, okay? So they're gonna receive information, they may process some of it, and then send a signal or not send a signal. Okay, they're gonna transmit information to other neurons or to muscles or to glands. And we'll talk about neurons in detail and how they send signals in the fourth week of class. We start talking about the nervous system. Hey, epithelial tissue is also a tissue type. Makes up epithelium, which are just sheet-like layers of cells that either line external body surfaces or hollow tubes and organs. Okay, and epithelial tissue is either specialized to act as a barrier or to act for transport. Okay, and this upper versus lower, which one do you think is acting as a barrier, the upper or the lower? The lower, and why do you think that's the barrier tissue? Because it's what? Because it's layered, layer. yeah. It's forming a larger protected barrier, whereas if you only have a single sheet of epithelial cells, it's less of a barrier. And then what do these cells have that make you think maybe they do transport? What are these little hair-like things called? Those are not cilia, they're microvilla. But they look a lot like cilia. And those are microvilli. That's increasing the surface area of the cells for transport. So this is the type of cell that we have lining our small intestine, right, as well as our kidney tubules. Right, whereas this is the type of epithelial layer we have on our skin. Right, and continuing talking about tissue types, okay, let's talk about that epithelial tissue that makes up glands, right? So glands are made up of epithelial tissue, and glands manufacture some sort of product. And you can separate glands into two classes, okay? Exocrine glands, and exocrine glands have ducts. Here's an example of an exocrine gland. And endocrine glands, endocrine glands are ductless. Okay, exocrine glands have ducts and they secrete their product into the duct and then that product enters the external environment, which might be the skin surface or it might be something like the GI tract because the GI tract is an external body surface from your mouth to your anus. So who can give me an example of an exocrine gland? Sweat glands, exactly, right? And their product would be sweat that's released to your skin surface. Okay, endocrine glands secrete their product into the bloodstream, and their product is a hormone. So who can give me an example of an endocrine gland? The pituitary gland, exactly. Who can give me an example of an organ that's both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland? The pancreas, excellent. So the pancreas releases what two hormones? Insulin and glucagon. And what does the exocrine portion of the pancreas release into the GI tract? Bicarbonate, good, and digestive enzymes. Okay, so the, the pancreas is both exocrine and endocrine. Right? All glands are made up of epithelial tissue. Okay, the last type of tissue we're going to talk about is connective tissue, and it's the most diverse type. Okay, examples are bone, tendons, fat or adipose tissues considered connective tissue, and blood. 
right? Most connective tissue is characterized by loads of extracellular matrix. Things think of like bone, okay? Except for blood, okay? Blood doesn't have an extracellular matrix. We've got free floating cells in a liquid medium, but it's put into connective tissue because it links parts of the body. Okay, most connective tissue is going to either anchor structures of the body, and that's why it has lots of extracellular matrix, or if we're talking about blood, it's linking all the parts of the body to deliver things like oxygen and nutrients and take away waste. Right, so blood is considered a connective tissue because it connects all your organs together. All right, so we're gonna move up one level to organs. So organs are two or more tissue types that work together to perform a particular function. So here we have a cross section of the small intestine. What tissue types do you think are in the small intestine? What kind? Epithelial tissue, definitely. Muscle tissue. What kind of muscles in the small intestine? Smooth, Smooth muscle. Good. Nervous. Nervous tissue. Right? Neurons are controlling the movement of that smooth muscle. Good. Connective tissue. Connective tissue. So all four tissue types are in the small intestine. And working together, what's the role of your small intestine? Digestion and absorption okay, of nutrients. Right, so all four of those tissue types work together for digestion and absorption. Okay, so organs that are grouped together performing related functions, okay, that do some sort of life-sustaining function are made up of our body systems or organ systems. Okay, so our organ systems are groups of organs that are working together to do some sort of life-sustaining function. Okay, we're going to talk about 11 systems. Circulatory, digestive, respiratory, urinary, skeletal, muscular, integumentary, immune, nervous, endocrine, and reproductive. So here we've got some nice figures showing each one of those body systems. So here we have the circulatory system. We spend three weeks talking about the circulatory system because it plays a major life-sustaining role, which is, what does our circulatory system do? Pumps blood. What does our blood do? Transport oxygen, nutrients, and transports away waste, right? Major life-sustaining function. Okay, our digestive system. We'll talk about that way at the end of the semester. What does our digestive system do for us? Digest and absorb, okay? Respiratory system. We'll talk about that in the last two thirds or so of the semester. What does our respiratory system do? Brings in oxygen and gets rid of CO2, okay, and we're going to talk about cellular metabolism, so we'll know why our respiratory system is bringing in oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. Okay, the urinary system, the heck does our urinary system do for us? Blood filtration, excellent answer, yeah, okay, so it filters out our blood, it plays a major role in determining blood volume and makeup. Most of the time, the reason why I say that's an excellent answer is most of the time everyone's like, oh, it gets rid of waste, which is true. But we're going to spend way more time talking about how it modulates blood volume and composition. Okay? Our skeletal system. What is it good for? Connection. Yeah, connection gives us structure, right? We're going to talk about how it's a intrabody storage site of calcium. We'll spend a lot more time talking about the skeletal system's role in providing calcium for us. Okay, in anatomy, you spend a lot of time measuring, measuring, naming, learning, memorizing. That's the word I was trying to come up with, memorizing the names of bones. You don't have to do that in the class, this class. Okay, so we actually don't talk about the skeletal system all that much in physiology. 
Okay, muscular system. What does our muscular system do? What's it doing for me right now? It moves me, right? Okay. In anatomy, you spend a lot of time memorizing the names of muscles. Okay. Here, we're just going to talk about the function, how they function. Okay, integumentary system. What does our skin, hair, and nails do for us? Protection, exactly. Okay, it also makes us look good. Okay, we don't talk about the integumentary system too much. Okay, the immune system. Similar to the integumentary system in that it does what for us? Protection, okay? So for anything that gets through the integumentary system, we've got our immune system to protect us. We'll talk about it at the end of the semester. Okay, the first body system we're gonna talk about is the nervous system. What the heck does our nervous system do for us? What has our brain ever done for us? <laughs> That's basically everything, right? It's our command center. Communication. Major role of the nervous system is communication. The other body system for communication is the endocrine system. They work in concert, okay? But the nervous system is faster than the endocrine system. So the endocrine system controls things that can happen on slower time scales. So things like development and growth and reproduction, okay? So things that can happen on slower time frames get controlled by the endocrine system. But the endocrine system and the nervous system work together, and you notice that the brain's being shown for both the endocrine system and the nervous system, okay? The last body system that we'll talk about the last week of class is the reproductive system. Okay, so the reproductive system does release a lot of hormones that are important for growth and sexual maturity, right? And then it allows us to propagate our species, right? Okay. So we are primarily water. And in this class, we're going to talk about water in different contexts. Okay, so here we've turned a human into a cube. Okay, and all this tan stuff are actually external body surfaces. So this would be the respiratory system, external body surface. This would be the GI tract, external body system or body surface. And here would be the urinary system, which is technically an external body surface. Okay. All the water inside our cells and outside our cells makes up our total body water, okay? And you have about 42 liters of water inside of you, okay? We are primarily water. Okay, total body water can be separated into intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid, okay? Intracellular fluid is all the water inside our cells. So here we have cells that are in our tissues, not in the circulatory system. Here we have water inside our cells within the circulatory system. Okay, so intracellular fluid averages about 28 liters. Extracellular fluid averages about 14 liters. So 28 plus 14 is total body water. Okay, so here we have all the extracellular fluid. Extracellular fluid can then get separated into other compartments. Okay, so we have total body water at the top that can get separated into extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. Okay, extracellular fluid can be further separated into what's called interstitial fluid or ISF and into plasma. Okay, so extracellular fluid within the circulatory system is your plasma. Okay, you have about three liters of plasma. Extracellular fluid not in your circulatory system is interstitial fluid, also known as tissue fluid, and that averages about 11 liters. Okay, that interstitial fluid, we'll talk about other fluid compartments within the interstitial fluid. We'll talk about cerebral spinal fluid. Where do you find cerebral spinal fluid? In the central nervous system, okay? So it's the extracellular fluid of the central nervous system. So that's your cerebral spinal fluid. And then we'll also talk about lymph. Where do you find lymph? In your lymph nodes, which are part of your lymphatic system. Okay, so these are smaller compartments of interstitial fluid. 
Okay, but we'll talk about extracellular fluid versus intracellular fluid because intracellular fluid has a different makeup than extracellular fluid. Okay, and plasma has a different makeup than interstitial fluid. And cerebral spinal fluid has a different makeup than other extracellular fluid that bathes other tissues. All right, and we'll talk about those differences as we go through those body systems. Right, but just sort of a vocabulary lesson to get everyone on the same page with those fluid compartments. All right, so we have gone from the chemical level to the organism level very briefly, right? And what we're going to do the rest of the semester is talk about how all our cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems act in concert to maintain homeostasis. Right? To maintain a stable internal environment. Okay? So we need all our body systems to be working well to maintain homeostasis. And in human physiology, I get to deliver all the good news. Right? So how our body is supposed to work and how amazing our body is. And then a lot of you are going to go on and take pathophysiology and talk about what can go wrong. And there's a lot. Okay? The pathophysiology book is way thicker. Okay? All right, so what we're going to do to finish up our introduction is to talk briefly about homeostasis. Since we'll spend all semester talking about it. Okay, so homeostasis is our ability to maintain relatively constant internal environment, like a constant body temperature, right? Constant volume of blood, constant composition of blood, right? Why do we want to regulate our body temperature? What happens if our body temperature gets too hot? You die. That's true. <laughs> you die. <laughs> but why do you die? If you undergo severe hyperthermia, you have a really high fever for an extended period of time, or you have heat stroke, etc. Why do you die? Yeah. It kills soft tissues. Like it, the water inside the cells. It does. It kills off tissues. Okay, most of our tissues are made up of proteins. Proteins are sensitive to temperature. If you heat up a protein too high, it unfolds. And once it unfolds, it doesn't work right anymore. Okay, so too high of a temperature makes our proteins unfold. Right, and once they unfold, we're not refolding them. Okay, what happens if you go hypothermic, if your body temperature drops? You could have, yes, you, you can die too, although your body temperature can go way lower, they can, can go higher. Your body processes like slow down. Yeah, your body processes slow down. What did you want to say in the back row? Um, cells freeze and burst. Right. If you lower your body temperature so much that your cells freeze and burst, you can't recover from that. Right? But first what happens is your body temperature lowers is your body slows down. Okay, so molecular movement slows down. All those electrons stop working or moving around as fast. Enzymes slow way down. Right? And when you slow down, you don't function very well. But hyperthermia is way more dangerous than hypothermia. So people who drowned in like freezing cold water, so this is the time of year when someone might fall through the ice. Right? You can potentially revive them after a half an hour of being submerged because their body has cooled right? and slowed down. Okay? So it's all about keeping our proteins happy. Okay, we regulate the volume and composition of our blood to regulate the volume and composition of our interstitial fluid to keep our cells happy, to keep them plump and nice. Okay? We need organ system integration to regulate homeostasis. And if you disrupt homeostasis, that is the basis of disease and death. Okay? In general, we regulate homeostasis by a process called negative feedback. Right? And this negative doesn't mean bad. Right? We'll talk about why it's called negative feedback. 
Okay, what happens if a regulated variable changes? We set into motion mechanisms that will bring it back to a set point. Okay, so we have a set point. If a variable goes above or below it, we set into motion mechanisms that will bring it back to set point. Okay, so for those of you who were driving in today, you shouldn't have been speeding, right? Because the roads were kind of bad, but maybe you're going 80 miles per hour on I-15. Okay, hopefully not. Maybe you were. So you realize you're going 80 miles per hour. What do you do when you realize you're going over the speed limit? Yep, you slow down. You either put on the brake, <laughs> put on the brake, or you just take your foot off the gas pedal. Okay, so the set point is the speed limit. When you go above it, okay, you take your foot off the brake and you slow back down to the speed point, to the speed limit. Okay, so that was negative feedback. You did the opposite of what you were doing in order to come back to set point. Negative feedback is also when you realize you're going way too slow. Okay, so say you're going 40 on I-15 and a semi comes up behind you and you realize, oh crap, because you're texting or something. Okay, realize you're going way too slow, you put your foot on the brake pedal, bring it back up to set point. That's also negative feedback. Okay, you do the opposite of the change to bring it back to set point. Okay, so the negative is just doing the opposite of the change to bring it back to set point. Okay, so examples of set points are things like core body temperature. We want to maintain a core body temperature. So that's the temperature within our internal environment, okay? Right now, your fingers and your toes are below 37. I guarantee it, okay? Your body doesn't care that much about that, right? It just cares that your liver's at 37 degrees and your heart's at 37 degrees, okay? And this is Celsius, right? Blood glucose, we regulate blood glucose to be at about 100 milligrams per deciliter. Why the heck do we regulate our blood glucose levels? It's our, blood glucose is your sugar level. Why do we regulate our sugar levels? Why don't we want them to go too low? Yeah. Diabetes, so too low will decrease our energy. Too, too high will damage tissues. Too high damages tissues, too low. Your brain needs sugar. Exactly, too low and your brain doesn't function. Right, you get hangry. <laughs> Right? So we regulate our blood glucose to be between 90 and 100 milligrams per deciliter to keep a constant supply of glucose going to our brain because our brain only runs on glucose. Everything else will happily run off of fatty acids. Right? We regulate blood glucose in order to keep our brain happy. Okay? Too low, we get cranky. Too high, you won't necessarily notice it behaviorally, but you'll start to damage your cells. Glucose is really reactive. We use it to make ATP because it's so reactive. You put too much of it into your bloodstream and it starts to react with things. It starts to glycosylate things, okay? Right, we also regulate the pH level of our blood to be about 7.4, so pretty neutral pH. Why do we regulate pH? First of all, what is pH? The level of acidity in the blood. So a measure of hydrogen ions. I heard someone mumble hydrogen ions. Okay, so the more hydrogen ions you have in the blood, what happens to your pH? It goes down. It goes down. Okay, so pH, the lower the pH, the more acidic something is. Okay, the higher the pH, the more basic something is. So why do you think we regulate our blood pH at a neutral level? What gets disrupted if pH goes too high or too low? It's the same thing that gets disrupted with temperature. Proteins. Proteins, exactly. Okay, so those hydrogen ions affect protein structure and function. Okay, so we regulate both temperature and pH to get our, keep our proteins happy. And we want to keep our proteins happy because they do all the work. Right? So we have all these set points. 
And then we have to have the ability to detect when we go above or below the set point. We have to have the ability to detect the error signal. Right, so here we've got an example looking at blood glucose. So our normal blood glucose level is about 100. Okay, if it goes above, because you had Captain Crunch for breakfast, okay, you're going to have blood glucose levels start to rise. That error signal gets detected by the pancreas. Okay, the pancreas releases what hormone in response to an increase in blood glucose? Insulin. Insulin. Excellent. Insulin then tells insulin-sensitive cells to take up blood glucose. Okay, so normally your skeletal muscle and your liver and your adipose tissue don't absorb glucose from the blood. If insulin's in the bloodstream, they will, right? And so as they absorb glucose, your blood glucose levels will decrease. The pancreas will detect that, stop secreting insulin. You'll go back to your set point, okay? So negative feedback. You get a change where you have an increase in blood glucose. You set a mechanism to decrease the blood glucose. As soon as it goes back to set, back, set point, you turn off the mechanism. Okay. How about you didn't have breakfast this morning? Okay. And your blood glucose, blood glucose levels are starting to drop. What hormone does the pancreas release in response to a drop in blood glucose? Glucagon, exactly, and glucagon tells skeletal muscle and liver cells and adipose tissue to release nutrients into the bloodstream, okay? So things like glucose, and then that will bring you back to set point. So both going above and below, the response is negative feedback, bring you back to set point, okay? So here we have the first flow diagram. Your textbook uses a ton of these. Okay, we've got a change in the regulated variable, an increase in blood glucose. Okay, it is detected by the integrating center, which is actually beta cells in the pancreas. They release insulin, which causes things like skeletal muscle and liver cells to take up the blood glucose, and that is going to decrease blood glucose, negatively feed back, and stop the response. The sugary snack you devour enters your digestive system and is broken down to simple sugars like glucose. Glucose enters the bloodstream, causing an increase in blood glucose levels. But various mechanisms bring blood glucose back down to its normal level, the set point. This is an example of homeostasis, the body's tendency to maintain relatively constant internal conditions. Hormones produced by the pancreas regulate blood glucose levels. Let's zoom in. When blood glucose levels are high, glucose molecules leave the blood and enter beta cells in the pancreas. The beta cells respond by releasing the hormone insulin. Insulin enters the bloodstream and is transported to cells all over the body. Let's see what happens in the liver. Insulin binds to receptors on liver cells. This causes the cells to take in more glucose. Inside the liver cells, glucose is converted to glycogen, a storage molecule. Blood glucose levels decrease as glucose is taken up by liver cells and other body cells. As a result, less and less insulin is released by the pancreas, and blood glucose levels stabilize at their set point. This is an example of how negative feedback maintains homeostasis. What happens if you've skipped lunch and your blood glucose levels are low? Let's zoom into the pancreas again. When blood glucose levels are low, alpha cells in the pancreas release the hormone glucagon. Glucagon enters the bloodstream and acts on target cells in the liver. Glucagon binds to receptors on the liver cells. 
signaling the liver cells to break glycogen down to glucose. Glucose is released. and blood glucose levels increase. As a result, less glucagon is released by the pancreas, and blood glucose levels stabilize at their set point. In this way, two hormones with opposing effects allow the body to maintain homeostasis of blood glucose levels. In diabetes, the body is unable to maintain homeostasis of blood glucose levels. In type 1 diabetes, the beta cells of the pancreas are destroyed by the immune system, and so no insulin is produced. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas produces insulin, but target cells do not take up glucose. In both types of diabetes, when blood glucose levels rise, cells do not take up the additional glucose, and so blood glucose remains high. This example shows the importance of homeostasis in everyone's life. Right, we'll talk about very few examples where the body uses what's called positive feedback, right? Most examples we'll talk about involve negative feedback, where you have a set point, you go away from it, the mechanism brings you back. In positive feedback, you get a rapid change in a variable. One of the examples of positive feedback right, is luteinization or ovulation, okay, so in ovulation in the female reproductive tract, the pituitary gland releases the hormone, luteinizing hormone, or LH, which acts on the hormone, or acts on the ovaries, causes the ovaries to secrete estrogen, that estrogen then positively feeds back and causes more LH secretion, causes more estrogen secretion. So estrogen levels rise and rise and rise, LH levels rise and rise and rise until you get ovulation, and then both luteinizing hormone and estrogen levels fall off. Okay? So you have a set point, and then you just move farther and farther away from it. Blood clotting is an example that occurs in both males and females that's under positive feedback. But again, most examples are negative feedback. We've got a set point. When we move away from it, we do some sort of mechanism to bring it back to set point. Okay, any questions about the basics of homeostasis?